Thank you for the invitation. Um, I had the opportunity to also uh, uh, listen to the two previous talks. So we'll a little bit try to provide some links to the previous talk, but basically my topic is on uh, the complexity of neurodevelopmental disorders. Of course, ADHD is the topic of ADHD Europe, but I will also argue that uh, all these neurodevelopmental disorders, so also including autism, uh, language disorders, seizures, and so on, are part of an overall family. And I will a little bit uh, talk about, uh, let's say, new conceptual models of how these um, different disorders hang uh, together. Um, so uh, I'm uh, involved in uh, at least four uh, big European projects. My uh, The CANDY project is the project that Hans uh, just mentioned. It's on the comorbidity between autism, ADHD, intellectual disability, and seizures disorders. Um, but I will also, I'm also involved in AIMS to Trials. That's a very big project on autism with the aim to identify biomarkers. So biomarkers that allow you to subtype, to stratify uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. PRIME is a very um, recent started project on the link between neurodevelopmental disorders and somatic disease like diabetes, uh, cardiovascular uh, arrhythm arrhythmias. And it's based on the idea that insulin signaling, so you know insulin from diabetes, that's the hormone that regulates uh, blood sugar levels, but the insulin uh, signaling system is not only relevant for the peripheral circulation, so for our bodies, but is also a signaling system in the brain. And then Eat to be Nice is another project. That's the project that's part of, or a trace study that Anik just explained is part of Eat to be Nice. And that's on the link between food and the microbiome and also like impulsivity, hyperactivity and other uh, behaviors. Just to tell you, this is my uh, declaration of interest. I'm involved with, uh, have been involved with a number of industries to provide, uh, let's say, advice. So this is, I think, the key slide. It's about the whole family of neurodevelopmental disorders, autism, ADHD, intellectual disability. And uh, the whole idea is to make you aware that many of these disorders are co-occurring. They have overlap in the same patient and in the same family. So it's, it's more often the case than the exception that uh, if you have a family and one child has autism, that another child has ADHD or vice versa, or that there is another child with a delayed language development or with motor developmental uh, coordination problems. And, and so this is, this is in fact the key what we are studying in the Candy Project uh, in terms of how can we explain and understand these, uh, this overlap at the level of the individual and the overlap at the level of the family. Well, developmental disorders, it's, it's a complex definition. It's a complex set of disorders. It's a umbrella term. And basically the idea is they are all linked to early developmental problems of the brain and later I will give a more explanation to this, but developmental problems of the brain that are associated with cognitive problems, cognitive challenges, so problems in executive functioning like planning, working memory, they are all heterogeneous and they have strong overlap. And uh, this is just um, uh, a slide to summarize uh, that we can adopt several complementary perspectives on ADHD and other developmental disorders. At the one hand, we, particularly in research, we tend to look at ADHD and autism as just dimensions. They are differences in grade or severity. Uh, some people have some symptoms, some people have more symptoms, some people are at the, at, at the extreme of the normal distribution that's in this slide and so most people are around average, uh, but you can also say it's quite a qualitative abnormality. So it's like uh, you have cases and you have controls. 
And in our research, we tend to combine mostly these two perspectives. We, we run analysis both on the assumption that it's a continuous score going from super concentrated, super focused, never impulsive, and so on, to always impulsive, always hyperactive, and super distracted. Yeah. This is the dimensional perspective. This is the case control perspective. And, and just to add what we call now the four Ds, you can look at all these disorders as uh, it's a disease, but the disease assumes that you know about the biomedical causes. That's not the case for ADHD and for autism and others. We could say it's a syndromal definition. That's a disorder. We could say it's a disability. But in the neurodiversity perspective, we, we tend now more and more also to say it's just difference. People with neurodevelopmental disorders are different, but not per se abnormal, diseased, or handicapped. Now, I think these perspectives are important. And uh, yeah, in the history of research, we have moved from disease to disorders to disability, I think, to now adopt, uh, in many cases, a more um, different type of perspective. This is all well known, of course. I like to go from the core symptoms to the associated symptoms, because in addition to the core symptoms, we now are aware that all these neurodevelopmental disorders are also defined by other problems like emotional problems, emotional lability, anxiety, depression, uh, that may have even more impact on daily life, may more interfere with daily life than the core symptoms. And so comorbidity is all over the place. Uh, I'm aware that Professor Larson will speak later on uh, also the link with somatic comorbidities and cardiovascular issues and so on. But look, all the whole range of learning problems, anxiety, depression, autism, it's all over the place. When we go to autism, we know the core symptoms are problems in social communication and interaction, rigidities and sensory abnormalities, but also for autism, we have the whole range of other comorbidities. Now, so that means that if you would just say, I focus on the core symptoms, then you would say autism and ADHD are completely different because the defining, the core characteristics are so widely different. But if you look at the broader picture, you would say, yeah, also in autism, we have ADHD comorbidity, we have anxiety, we have depression, we have sleep problems, we have self-injury and aggression. Then you would say they come more together and it's in fact uh, not unexpected. It's quite expected that there might be a high degree of overlap. Now the core idea uh, neurodevelopmentally is that we think these neurodevelopmental disorders are uh, arising from early disruptions of normal brain development and these early disruptions may be very minor early on but they amplify over development and for this I like to show you these cartoons it's like the snowball you start with just a hand of snow and uh, the snowball is rolling and is rolling and gets more momentum and it gets larger. And so these presumably very <laughs> tiny early disruptions of brain development amplify and they tend to become associated with an adverse poorer outcome. And this is not a fully deterministic process. It's also dependent on the genetics of the child, genetic predisposition, um, environmental influences, uh, the interaction between the child's behavior and the environment, so family structure, family climate, family influences, and uh, what we now call transactional uh, effects and protective and supportive effects. So, so, so this is the framework. We like to understand the complexity of how very tiny uh, problems in brain development gets amplified and may ultimately be associated with later risk and developmental problems. Now, this is already my last slide. 
but it's probably the most complicated because this is like the scheme we follow in our candy grant to try to understand to understand the overlap between the different neurodevelopmental disorders. And so this grant presupposes that we have early genetic influences on brain development. And these influences involve what we call technically, what we call common genes that are genetic variations that are uh, in all of us. These are not per se disease genes. These are just normal common variations of all our genes. But some of these genes may impose a slightly, very slightly increased risk for a developmental problem. And when you have just one or two or 10 of these small risk variants, nothing is, is no problem at all. But when you have 100 or maybe 500 of all of these risk genes with a very small effect, these small effects may accumulate, they, they are aggravated each other, and they may move you into the, let's say, mm -hmm. risk, the risk area. And then there is also the effect of uh, uh, rare genes, so uh, more rare genes not occurring in um, many people in the population, there may be one in 1,000 people, one in 10,000, but if they occur, they have a stronger effect. And for uh, the, the neurodevelopmental disorders, we are now particularly interested in two types of genes. That's genes that are impact on glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter. Most of the audience will be familiar with dopamine for Parkinson's disease, for example, serotonin for anxiety and depression, noradrenaline, but glutamate is another very relevant uh, neurotransmitter system in the, in, the, in the brain. And it's an excitatory, so a stimulatory neurotransmitter system. And the other is GABA, GABAergic neurotransmitter system. It's also very important in the brain and it's the inhibitory, the inhibitory uh, in, uh, a neurotransmitter system. And this fits into the theory that a disbalance between excitation and inhibition, the disbalance is crucial, or the balance between inhibition and in excitation is crucial for the brain maturation early on. And now my link to the previous talk on RTMS is uh, that uh, we have heard that uh, RTMS is able to uh, specifically excite or inhibit certain brain regions. So, so in principle, we could make a link between the research on excitation inhibition, the biochemical and genetic research, and the potential of RTMS and other um, brain technology to influence targeted certain brain areas, cortical fields in particular, to try to restore and to treat uh, symptoms of neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, and then, and then uh, to summarize, so the EI imbalance, the imbalance between excitation and inhibition may also impair circuit neuroplasticity. Now the link to the previous talk on the diet, because there are two other uh, factors, etiological factors, that may modify brain development and also modify the outcome of people with neurodevelopmental disorders. And the one is the microbiome. And the microbiome is the whole of the bacteria in our uh, gastrointestinal tract, in our gut system. And you may say, uh, I never did know that the microbacteria, the bacteria in my gut were so important. Um, and I have to say, 10 years ago, I didn't know either, but it's a fascinating new area of research. And it points to the fact that even early during brain development, when babies are born, the link between the microbiome and the brain is extremely important. So animals that are born, what we call uh, free of bacteria, are very vulnerable in the brain development. 
And so we are now studying the composition of the microbiome in patients with autism and ADHD. That's uh, particularly in Nijmegen research from my colleague uh, Arias Vasquez. And we have, for example, established that there are links between the composition of the microbiome and the reaction of the brain in those patients to certain stimuli and certain cognitive tasks. So the idea is that uh, the microbiome may have a positive or negative influence on uh, brain function. And then, so what uh, Anik just told you in the previous lecture is that we are studying whether diets are able to influence behavior, but we are also studying the microbiome in these patients, in these children. We do that by taking what we call frozen stool. We like them, we ask them to collect feces, stool, to freeze it. And then in the lab, we analyze the bacteria and we try to figure out whether we can influence or change the microbiome by dietary strategies. And the last part of this slide I like to explain is uh, the right column. And that's also saying that the immune system is relevant for understanding developmental disorders. And just one piece of evidence is that um, infections du during pregnancy, the flu, COVID, mention it, are just uh, rather common and mostly innocent. So an infection, a pregnant mother that gets the flu means that her immune system is activated. Her immune system is activated to combat the infection. She has one day, two day, maybe five days of flu. She has some fever, she is fatigued, she has some sleeping problems, but then the flu goes away. She, re she uh, restores. She recovers. But in some women, the immune system stays to be activated. That's called early maternal immune activation. So the immune system does not shut off, work finished, infection combated, but the immune system stays to be activated. That means that the immune solubles that uh, the they, these are called cytokines. They stay into the maternal circulation. They may enter the fetal circulation. They may enter the uterus, pass the placenta, enter the fetal circulation, and they may impair and interfere with brain development. And uh, other pieces of evidence for the relevance of the immune system is that uh, if uh, in the families, there's more family members with uh, uh, immune diseases like allergy, asthma, autoimmune diseases, and so on, then there is a higher risk in association with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, th this is just our scheme. It's, it's mostly still a scheme with a lot of hypothesized links. And we follow this scheme, this scheme in, in the CANDY project, also in the aims to trials project, to try to understand why some children develop autism or ADHD or intellectual disability or seizures, why some have the combination. And we uh, try to uh, also utilize this increased biological understanding to reflect and to consider uh, new uh, treatments. So this is basically what I wanted to tell you. Uh, no results so far. Uh, this is the final slide. And this is just a trigger to uh, check whether you have some questions and I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. So uh, thank you, Professor Jan Buitenaar. This was uh, really, you, you really showed us the complexity and all the strings to different neurotransmitters, not only dopamine, but also noradrenaline, glutamate, et cetera. And, uh, it is really a challenge what you're doing in Candy to try to grab this complexity and then see which of your hypothesis is valid and which will be rejected. So uh, I hope we can see you back when results are coming in and then we can disseminate them in people with ADHD, 
in all the caretakers, all the scientists and all over Europe. So this was really for us also a kind of kickoff to wait for the results. When, yeah. when do you think the first results will be coming in? Now, you know, we, we have started data collection two years ago. We were hampered by COVID. We, uh, several of our sites had to close the lab. We were not allowed uh, to continue animal studies. And also we were not allowed to continue scanning and recruitment. So we are delayed. I would expect results not earlier than in two years. Uh, I, I like to take the opportunity, by the way, to also thank uh, ADHD Europe, uh, because ADHD Europe is a um, partner and advisor, not only for Candy, but also for Prime. And, yeah. and uh, we like uh, in, in all stages of our research, when we will have results uh, to involve uh, uh, representatives, ADHD Europe, also Autism Europe, other patient re representatives to, to think with us about the meaning of the results and to think about uh, conclusions and uh, treatment and policy recommendations. So, so okay. when we have results, I'm happy to be back for a uh, yeah. update. Absolutely. And thank you for giving me this bridge because, uh, as you know, ADHD Europe uh, loves to be involved in uh, scientific researches 